This is the fourth chapter entitled The Path Beyond. The Pali for this section reads Katama Chasa Pikoe, Majima Patipada Tathagatena, Abhisambuddha Chakku Karani, Nyana Karani, Upasamaya Abhinyaya Sambodhaya Nibhanaya Sangvatati. Ayameva Aryo Atangiko Mago Sayaditang Samaditi Sama Sankapo Sama Vacha Sama Kamanto Sama Achivo Sama Vayamo Sama Sati Sama Samadhi Ayanko Sapikoe Majima Patipada Tathagatena Abhisambuddha Chakukarani Nyana Karani Upasamaya Abhinyaya Sambodhaya Nibhanaya Sangvatati And the translation reads uh, briefly, And what is the middle way that a Tathagata has awakened to, which gives vision and leads to Nibbāna? It is the noble eightfold path, that is to say, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness. This is the middle way that a Tathagata has awakened to. Oh, just as we had that... Uh, um, question I think from Martin the other day um, this is uh, a significant that when the Buddha is asked to in a, uh, in a sense to define what that middle way is uh, he spells it out as the Eightfold Path that that, that is the path that uh, that takes us through the middle that is the way of of balance itself and then as you remember that uh, uh, word Samma uh, which is translated here as the English word right um, uh, that uh, it's good to think of that also as in a uh, right as in attuned or, or balanced uh, as well as right as opposed to, to wrong so attuned view attuned intention uh, speech action livelihood effort uh, mindfulness and collectedness and Ajahn Sajito uh, notably uh, translates samadhi as collectedness rather than concentration um, and uh, just as a as a comment on that um, the uh, in a way the word collectedness is is a bit more accurate than concentration concentration is the customary or most common way of translating uh, samadhi um, but uh, the uh, if you if you look at the etymology of it uh, the the d of it, it is the same as the the word dir which forms dhamma and some uh, the sama in that um, uh, uh, that particular um, formation is uh, sung as in together, so it means um, that which is held together, that which is holding things together. So collectedness, literally where things are collected together. So samadhi uh, as a word, um, uh, more accurately in English, is, is translated as collectedness. So then Ajahn Sajito writes, the frames of the illumination often come in a pair or triad that form a set relating to each other in certain ways. The contents of this frame follow from the previous panel. This is what the middle way is about and how it can be defined in conventional terms. So, as I was mentioning last time, this is like the, the window of the, the little chapel, the little uh, shepherd's church down below uh, Chidhurst. And similarly, this, this panel is also in that same form of a sort of Christian church window. And so... It sort of resonates uh, and is a sort of continuation of that passage that uh, we began with yesterday, which was the Dweme Bikoe Anta, the two, two extremes. So then this is the spelling out what is the middle path. This is what the middle way is about and how it can be defined in conventional terms. It also continues to approach human life broadly. Here, the Buddha is not formulating a particular set of beliefs or assumptions that you have to take on board before you can understand the teachings. He teaches in a way that is accessible to any religious path. Coincidentally, at the time of creating these particular paintings, I was in the habit of visiting a small, rarely used church near the monastery where I was living. <laughs> Uh, the monastery was very busy with renovation work, and in my free time I would go to the nearby church to practice my chanting and meditate. 
I developed a great appreciation of the calm atmosphere, the simplicity, and the sense of dedication within that tiny old church. Such things go beyond the beliefs of any one religion. Remembering this, I have framed the broad outlines of the Buddha's teaching with the window of that church. Well, incidentally, that little church was um, is also mentioned in the Doomsday Book, so it has been there for about a thousand years. So uh, there was, um, uh, whereas so up at the top of the hill you had Chithurst House, which is in a sort of ferment of activity. You had to strip the whole place out from. At a certain point, you could stand in the basement and see the stars through the the holes in the roof. That uh, the whole place was filled with dry rot and uh, had to be stripped back to the brickwork in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> the areas of the building. Very little of it could just be left as it was. And so, for the first five years of the life of Chithas Monastery, it was a a a bit of a construction site. Uh, I was there for much of the time and. Uh, so was Ajahn Sajito, so that uh, the, the, his uh, image of a calm sanctuary down at the bottom of the hill that's also been there for a thousand years <laughs> was very uh, a very good counterpoint. And as I mentioned, then he was learning to recite the monastic rule, the Padimoka, uh, which is um, the, the monk's training rules, is about 13,000 words long. So uh, he would take a, a t time away from the, the busy... Um, uh, work activity of, of Chithurst and go down and, and uh, learn his chanting down at the little sh shepherd's church. By the, the church is probably about a fifth of the size of this room, maybe even smaller than that. It's probably as long from one one end to the other as uh, as is across this this building. It's a really tiny little place. The lotus is often used in Buddhist art as a symbol of purity, for the path is one of purity, the purity of selflessness. The lotus arises from the mud of the ordinary earthbound mind and always turns towards the sun, to that which is higher than low or selfish feelings. In this way, it conveys the mood of the word ario, meaning noble, for nobility is the quality in us that rises above pettiness, selfishness and narrow-mindedness. And speaking about um, the word Arya, or Aryo, uh, is, uh, he's referring to it here in terms of the Aryo Atangiko Mago, the noble Aryo Atangiko Eightfold Mago path. So <clears throat> one of the the aspects of the um, Four Noble Truths that Lumpo Sumedha would, would stress repeatedly is that the, uh, the word Arya is very significant insofar as... Um, the Four Noble Truths, they're not, uh, they're not ultimate truths, they're not uh, sort of statements, uh, sort of declarations of, of an ultimate reality, but they are noble insofar as they're conventional truths, they're ordinary or worldly truths, but they're noble insofar as if they are um, embraced and understood, then they lead to that quality of, uh, of transcendence, they, they lead to um, the you know, direct realization of that ultimate truth as a, uh, a known and individual uh, experience. So that <clears throat> oftentimes people will see the Four Noble Truths or read about them and they, they take them as sort of these kind of ultimate declarations of the Buddha saying, uh, and oftentimes, particularly the First Noble Truth, you know, the, the Buddha said everything is suffering um, as a statement of ultimate reality and therefore that sounds extremely depressing. <laughs> And people will have, uh, and uh, over many uh, uh, many years, uh, there was either accidental or deliberate misinterpretation of uh, of the Buddha Dhamma as being negative because of taking that declaration idang dukang. You know, there is the first noble truth. This is dukkha. There is dukkha as being a, a statement of an ultimate truth. But the point about the uh, the word Arya, I think Ajahn Sajito. Um, characterizes it very, very beautifully here with the image of, of the lotus, is that it's the the quality of, of nobility is it's a conventional truth, uh, but it's a, a truth that that leads on to that which is beyond convention, that which is uh, you know, ultimate or, or uh, uh, fundamentally and absolutely real. The different aspects of the path are all characterized as samma, meaning right, perfect or consummate. The Buddha is talking about the following principles of being noble in different aspects of life. 
The first factor, right view, samaditi, is concerned with having a proper perspective on life. Right view places wisdom on an experiential rather than abstract foundation and is in turn the basis for right thought or right intention, sama sankapa. The list continues with rightness in one's speech and action and it can be called virtue. The last three factors relate to the direct practice of mind cultivation, vayamo, effort, sati, mindfulness, and samadhi, collectedness and concentration. These are most often cultivated through formal meditation exercises. And so uh, uh, these uh, uh, eight factors of the path are often summarized, uh, as Ajahn Sarita goes on to explain, in the three basic sections. So you have the wisdom section, the first two, which is your right view and right intention. And then the, the conduct uh, section, or sila, um, which is uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then the, uh, the, um, um, the meditation, or the, um, uh, the um, concentration aspect, which is the last three, uh, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. So they're often you, you hear the phrase sila samadhi panya, virtue, concentration, and wisdom. And that's like a, a synopsis of, of the, um, the whole group of, of eight factors, sort of divided into those three chunks. But it's also significant that in the Buddha's expression of it, that right view and uh, right thought or right intention come first, so that the wisdom uh, faculty uh, it comes before the, the sila one, which is... Uh, uh, a point I'll maybe say a little bit about later on. So, wisdom, virtue, and meditation can be reference points for anyone on the spiritual path. Together, they present a complete and integrated approach. Various religions or different ways of cultivating the mind may emphasize one aspect or another. For example, some religions place a great, place a great stress on morality and conventions with promises of heavenly re rewards for those who obey and punishment for those who don't. Such attitudes often omit and may even reject the possibility for personal reflection. Unguided by wisdom, moral commandments lead to fundamentalism with the intolerance, repression and blinkered conceit that it brings about. And so uh, as everyone is away, we don't have to look very far to see the results of religious fundamentalism in the world um, today, as a, a, that is, uh, was the case in the time of the Buddha and is still the case that um, I think Ajahn Sajita also puts it very diplomatically here. <laughs> so that uh, sense of sila or, or the um, uh, aspects of uh, uh, religious principles or ethics when appreciated or, or taken hold of without wisdom um, or without personal reflection, as he puts it, then um, that can lead to, to fundamentalism or a, a narrowness of view. It's also uh, interesting that in many religious traditions that um, people are actually uh, forbidden to, to, to learn and consult the scriptures themselves, both within the, the Indian traditions of, say, the, the Vedic teachings that were only to be uh, remembered and, and recollected and expounded on by Brahmins, so that people were not allowed to, to, um, to learn or to recite um, the the uh, the words of the scriptures and if someone from a lower caste at least I understand it from reading the history books if someone from a lower caste um, or from the lowest caste you know, repeated some verses of the of the Vedas then they could have their their tongue cut out uh, uh, or if they if they overheard the Brahmin reciting the, the scriptures they could have like molten lead poured in their ears to to deafen them similarly in in, the, in Europe uh, people were one of the, the great revolutions of the, um, the Reformation, Martin Luther and such, was to actually put the Bible into uh, common speech, into, into German, and so that people could read the Bible for themselves, because up to that point it was very strictly the case that the Bible was only to be interpreted by the priests, and that uh, it would be um, uh, a, a sort of heinous and awful uh, mistake and wrongdoing for a person to, uh, a, a non ordained person to, to read and to study the Bible for themselves. That was part of the big Christian revolution in the, the Ref, what's called the Reformation of um, actually printing the Bible. It was a revolutionary act in this country um, 
the people were um, severely punished and um, uh, it was a, a, a big social issue like the, the uh, putting the Bible into English and um, and making it available for the for the common people to be able to read it um, it was only after um, Henry VIII and the establishment of the, the Church of England and that um, uh, so they later became sort of uh, <clears throat> standardized and they, and they put a whole group of scholars together to create the, the King James version of the Bible but in the uh, earliest uh, years it was a sort of revolutionary act to, to put the Bible into English and to sort of circulate uh, clandestine uh, circulation of copies of, of the Bible that people could read on their own so the the Buddha's approach was was very very different and one of the reasons why um, he was much criticized and blamed by the um, the sort of Vedic uh, orthodoxy and the the Brahmins in particular was because he welcomed people from all castes into uh, into the Sangha and uh, whether you're from a, a high Kshatriya warrior noble or a Brahmin caste or from the Sudras or, or from the um, the Chandalas and the you know the lowest uh, or what are known as the untouchable uh, castes or those who are outside of the uh, the, the fold uh, then he um, was would accept everybody anybody and everybody into the Sangha um, regardless of their their social background so that was um, uh, very um, very much counter to the, to the traditions of his time and also one of the reasons why there was a strict prohibition about not writing the teachings down was so that uh, they would always be passed on by rote learning so that people from any background it didn't matter whether you could read or not because usually only the Brahmins were able to read um, but uh, people who, who couldn't eat couldn't read would learn the the, the, um, the, the teachings the, the, and the teachings through um, uh, through hearing through listening and repeating with a with a, an acharya with a teacher and so that the the verbal teachings and the record of the Buddha's words were passed down to anybody and everybody who was interested to listen and to learn so that availability um, and openness of the teaching was was also a revolutionary approach of the Buddha and as he said I, I don't use the teachers closed fist so that was a, a, a term that was there in the Brahmin tradition that the closed fist of the teacher that part of the teachers job was to hide the teachings to keep a closed fist so that the the, the teachings were, were kept sort of uh, uh, secret and only available to uh, to a select few. Um, so that uh, in the the Buddhist tradition, it actually encourages that knowing and learning the, the teachings for yourself, and then being able to ref reflect upon them for yourself, rather than always having the intermediary of a of a priest or an imam or a a, um, a minister to to do the interpretation for you. So he carries on. A subtler attachment to virtue is the belief that if you just keep performing good actions, such as ritual offerings to gods, then this in itself will get you somewhere without any further work on the mind. This affects Buddhism too. In Buddhist countries, there's a very strong feeling about accumulating merit, quote unquote, by making offerings to monks or temples. This has a certain truth in it and was even encouraged by the Buddha. Generosity is a sign of a, of a selfless heart. A great blessing to the world. Unfortunately, the idea of quote, gaining merit unquote, can substitute for true selflessness and make one feel that no further cultivation is necessary. So the Buddha always pointed out that the highest kind of merit, even greater than giving alms to a Buddha, was to cultivate meditation properly. And then he quotes um, this sutta from the, the Book of the Nines. I think this is the Velama Sutta, uh, Sutta number 20 in the Book of the Nines. And he, he abbreviates it here. Fruitful as the act of giving is, yet it is, still more, it is still more fruitful to go with confident heart for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha and determine the five moral precepts. Fruitful though that is, yet it is still more fruitful to maintain loving kindness for the period of time that it takes to milk a cow. It's about 20 minutes for those of you not familiar with cow milking. <clears throat> fruitful though that is, it is still more fruitful to maintain awareness of impermanence for only as long as a finger snap. So, and that starts off that Velama Sutta uh, 
with a description of the, the Buddha from a previous life of his when he was a, a very, very wealthy Brahmin. He says uh, he made this uh, extraordinarily abundant offering, 84,000 silver pots filled with gold coins, 84,000 gold, uh, gold pots filled with silver coins, you know, a thousand horses, a thousand elephants, you know, a thousand uh, cows and, and uh, everything. And, uh, and made this, this massive offering, which would be worth uh, billions of, of pounds nowadays. And then he uh, and he says, "Yeah, but uh, but more uh, more um, beneficial, more fruitful from that than an offering even of that size is to take refuge in Buddha Dhamma and Sangha and to keep the five precepts." So um, this is, uh, as most people will be uh, aware, very much a centerpiece of the the day to day observance and, and uh, the, the the way of life in Buddhist countries and what um, also keeps the uh, the servery and the tables groaning on a daily basis here and keeps uh, Jose busy in the kitchen. Uh, this massive uh, abundant offerings. And so we're not resenting in any way that people do make offerings here. We all, we all get hungry most days. So we're, we're glad that people do come and make offerings. But um, a, a, this is a, a teaching that is very significant um, to bear in mind that even a, a massively abundant and expensive offering is not as uh, valuable to us spiritually as taking refuge and keeping the precepts. And even more helpful is to practice loving kindness for 20 minutes. If you want to, be, and then to say, if you really, really want to make merit, if you if you want to um, uh, offer merit in the most uh, abundant way, then to develop wisdom, as then uh, as it's characterized here through the the development of the true. Uh, appreciation of anicca, the awareness of impermanence, the anicca just for a moment to really see and know anicca, uh, as we were sort of discussing in previous days, is um, to really know anicca is uh, in a sense the um, the um, embodiment of that entering of the stream. If if we really know that all that arises passes away, if that really enters the heart. And, uh, and there's a, a full and complete awareness of that, even just for a moment, then that is um, uh, synonymous with the entry uh, uh, of the uh, entering into the stream. And the, the, uh, the merit or the spiritual brightness that comes forth from that is, is far, far greater than even offering you know, billions and uh, billions of pounds. But of course, if you do want to help support the long-term plan for... <laughs> Any spare billions you happen to have lying around, then you know, all offerings will be appreciated, as well as the insight into Anicca. At the other extreme are those who don't bother with any morality or conventions, and think that they can become enlightened just through sitting in meditation. This is more common in the West. People can get really obsessive about having the right conditions to SIT, capital S, capital I, capital T, in. People can get really obsessive about having the right conditions to sit in and yet pay no attention to selfless actions, kindness or sense restraint. Meditation becomes motivated by the need for self-affirmation, a drive to attain samadhi, experience bliss or remodel oneself. That's the meditation fanatic's attitude. However, a steady and sensitive mind leads to proper understanding and right conduct in daily life. So the Buddha always, always related meditation not to ecstatic trances or complex abstractions, but to good sense that would manifest in mundane as well as transcendent terms. Then again, wisdom itself can be developed to the point where it loses contact with reality, as in the case of metaphysics. Philosophy and theology rely heavily upon intellectual understanding, yet fall short in the development of wisdom through attention to actual experience. So, having a mind full of ideas does not necessarily grant one any clearer perspective on how to live one's life. Even with proper wisdom and virtue, without the assiduous practice of inner contemplation that meditation exercises make possible, one is sowing good seeds, but is not tasting the fruit. And so, uh, the word metaphysics, for those who are, for whom English is not your first language, that means... Um, the the way that things work that are, are outside of our ordinary sense perceptions or things that are not visible or, or um, discernible through our ordinary senses that which is sort of beyond the, the sense world and uh, this was a, a um, 
uh, a very common theme of uh, of Lumpo Chars in, in Thailand, particularly when um, people who were experts in Abhidhamma came to visit the monastery, or he came he met with people who were university uh, professors or um, uh, had a, a wide knowledge of, of Buddhist teachings. That um, he would uh, say uh, uh, emphasize that this was say uh, uh, in, in a in, in a large respect, you're, you're you're living in the midst of the teaching, and you're so like the the the, the uh, like the the ladle for the soup, you know that uh, it sits in the pot of the soup. It's right in the pot. It's right in the in the in the soup. It's surrounded by the soup. It's buried in the soup, but it can't taste the soup because it's the it's the ladle. And the, and so he said, it's like you're right in the middle of the Buddha's teachings. You're studying the Buddha's teachings. You're completely immersed in it, but just like the ladle can't taste the flavor. You, you know, you're not you're not letting yourself really make use of the the blessings that you're totally surrounded with, and um, I think it's in um, uh, the the um, the book. Uh, I think it's the closing chapter, the closing section of the of the of the book Taste of Freedom, where um, he was talking with a, a a person here in England when he was visiting in the 1970s, talking with someone who had been a uh, a bit of a Buddhist scholar for for years and years, and um, you know, being from Northeast Thailand, uh, uh, he was spoken a very in their normal way of speaking is very direct and earthy, and uh, so I'm not sure how Lumpur Sumedho translated it when when um, he put it into English for the person, but uh, the the comment that Lumpur Cha made was to this very very sincere uh, practitioner saying you're you know, you know so much about Buddhism, but it's like someone who keeps chickens. And you, you you put all this effort into looking after the chickens and taking care of them and feeding them and protecting them, but then all you do is you collect the chicken shit and you you don't take, you don't collect the eggs. So you know you're really missing the point here. Uh, I think uh, there was a bit of um, quick <laughs> quick uh, quick thinking on on Lumpur Sumedho's uh, part but to render that into something a little bit more polite for uh, English niceties. But um, it's it's. Uh, uh, I think it's, it takes that form in the book Taste of Freedom. The original uh, rendition is there. So, if individually no single aspect of the spiritual path is conducive to, quote, peace, profound understanding and full realization, where is the way? It is broader and yet more exacting than any of these possibilities. And then he quotes from the, the Buddha in the Sutta Nipata. I do not say that you can attain purity by views, traditions, insight, morality, or conventions. Nor will you attain purity without these. But by using them for abandonment rather than as positions to hold on to, you will come to be at peace without the need to be anything. That's a very useful little uh, passage. It's verse uh, 848 from the Sutta Nipata. So I do not say that you can attain purity by views, traditions, insight, morality, or conventions. So those things on their own will not purify or liberate you, nor will you attain purity without them. But uh, you, you know, they won't, they're they not sufficient on their own to liberate you, but they are useful and uh, essential tools along the way. But by using them for abandonment, rather than as positions to hold on to, you will come to be at peace without the need to be anything. So as I, I've been speaking about a bit during this uh, retreat time, this is, uh, in a way, talking about how to apply the factors of the path for a process of abandonment, not creating more of a sense of self-view, like uh, like I've been saying, you can practice the Dhamma based on self-view, uh, or you can practice the Dhamma based on right view, and that it's through learning how to apply uh, right effort, samavayamo, putting forth the effort, but without that being personalized, me trying to become something, me trying to get rid of my bad habits, me trying to get uh, enlightened, me trying to become a, at least a stream enterer, all of that I and me and mine, even though it seems reasonable, that uh, uh, it's uh, in a way <coughs> creating obstacles and complications. But the, the essence of practicing Dhamma and developing the path in the most skillful way is through applying effort but without that being woven into uh, self-view uh, and uh, and conceit. So as he puts it here, using them for abandonment 
rather than as positions to hold on to or things to identify with. Like, I, uh, this is my tradition, these are my views, uh, I, you know, this is my insight, you know, I am keeping the sila, or you know, these are the, the right things uh, for me to do. So then he continues. The middle way, that is the Eightfold Path, is the balance and counterbalance of all the spiritual fundamentals. It summarizes the ways in which one cultivates a spiritual path and then qualifies that with the reminder that the path is to be cultivated in ways that are right. Now consider that bland prefix, right. Summar means whole or complete. It means ways that are not partial, biased or self-oriented, but are ways that are of benefit to others as well as to oneself. Summar conveys a whole balanced feeling. This is the rightness that is noble rather than perfectionist. And to consider another meaning of noble, it's also an indication of something rare. If we practice meditation with wrong view, we will always remain obsessed with ourselves, trying to cultivate something for ourselves or simply be mesmerized by a particular problem, a vice or a virtue. Meditation is not an answer in itself. We need the guidance to ward off the obsessiveness that accumulates around anything that is seen in personal terms. To abandon self-conscious drives and ambitions without abandoning the practice requires skill. How can I, an unawakened worldling with a head full of noise, acquire that skill? How to find that right balance is explained in the subsequent teaching, a teaching that the Buddha said was peculiar to fully enlightened beings, and it's based on something that everybody knows about. That's where he goes on to the Four Noble Truths. <clears throat> So there's a very uh, useful and interesting teaching, uh, Sutta number 117 in the Middle Length Discourses, called the Great uh, Great Forty or the Mahachatarisaka Sutta. Uh, and in that, the Buddha talks about two levels of the Eightfold Path. And so this is the the Eightfold Path, uh, so the mundane Eightfold Path, which uh, is essentially like. Uh, uh, one way of reading it is to, to say, well, essentially this is developing the Eightfold Path, but still based on right view. Yeah? Me trying to behave appropriately, me trying to, to develop right speech, me trying to give up my bad speech habits, me trying to get concentrated, me trying to follow the, um, uh, the Buddha's path. So there is the development of the path, but it's, it's a mundane and worldly and, uh, and is, um, say, woven together with those... Uh, conditions uh, and personal concerns and then the uh, the next le level of the, or the other level of the path is um, is the uh, say the super mundane uh, uh, eightfold path and it's still the same eight factors the same eight qualities but they are um, uh, say practiced on the the basis of of uh, of actual right view they're tra they're practiced without the uh, delusions of uh, of, of, uh, of self, the self conceit of I am, I, me, and mine woven into that. So, if uh, if you want to look that up, it's a very you know, rich and useful sutta, the the Great Forty, uh, Sutta 117, and and it, uh, in a way, it's just describing how that yet you know, we need to begin with those worldly and personal approaches like you know, me practicing by right speech is better than me not practicing right speech <laughs> the me trying to get concentrated is better than no effort to, to concentrate and so forth but it's also talking about that recognizing that as a preliminary or, or basic stage that then the, those habits of, of self-view and conceit then can be abandoned and that the path can be developed uh, free of those those obstructions and limitations um, briefly then going back to um, if you want to pass the tome around if you like <laughs> with the uh, let's see if we've got the uh, here we are so that's the uh, original church window from a shepherd's cottage shepherd's church <clears throat> so the, there's a very famous uh, sut, uh, Dhamma talk given by Ajahn Mahabua called Wisdom Develops Samadhi. And that um, 
that Thomas Merton, who was a well-known Christian monk, Trappist monk, and um, scholar and writer, he, he referred to as a spiritual masterpiece. And uh, in that, that Dhamma talk, because in, in Thailand in particular, I'm not sure how it is in Sri Lanka or other Buddhist countries, but there's uh, very much the, the view that you have to develop sila first of all, that's the, that's the ground, you develop sila first, and then uh, out of sila, then you you're develop your concentration, and having established concentration, then you uh, you develop wisdom. And there's certainly there's a lot of, of backup for that. There's many teachings that, that talk about things in those ways. But uh, in this particular Dhamma talk, which uh, uh, the, uh, it's, um, I think it was one of the very first things that was translated by Jamaha Mahabur was put into English, he makes the point that um, in order to practice sila in the most skillful way, you need, uh, and it's most useful, to be applying wisdom as you go along, to have that discerning quality and recognizing how to, uh, how to behave. What is, what is a beautiful conduct? What is appropriate to the time, the place, the situation? Are you aware that you're bending the truth for the sake of telling a good story? Are you aware that 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 thing that you're you're interested in might belong to somebody else. You know, how are you relating to that feeling? Uh, so he uh, and it's it's very well worth seeking out. I'm, I'm sure we have many copies in the, in the library. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's called Wisdom Develops Samadhi, and it's um, the uh, similar point being when we are developing samadhi, then in order to uh, establish concentration, then using wisdom to uh, to discern what the mind is getting distracted by. So he is encouraging the use of, of a reflection, wise reflection and investigation to look at the process of distraction, to see what's the thing that's making you distracted, uh, and understanding that and uh, using the reflective faculty to, uh, to know and to explore the mechanics of distraction. When you understand how distraction works, then you can uh, you can remove the causes for that. If you're just trying to develop concentration through through just a, a uh, as an act of will, uh, or you're trying to develop sila just as sort of following the rules, then you're you're making things a lot harder for yourself. And the point that he, he makes is that that in the uh, in the eightfold path, it's not an accident that the Buddha puts right view and right uh, uh, right uh, intention. Uh, first of all, that <clears throat> that those wisdom faculties, the w- the wisdom factors, uh, are, it's not just a chance that they're first, but if that quality of right view, right understanding, the uh, and right intention is uh, uh, say there to begin with, that's established. Then it makes it reduces the the work enormously to. Uh, to be able to um, behave appropriately according to time and place and situation, uh, and also to help the mind to develop concentration. The, um, yeah, the <clears throat> if, if we are ready to use the, the wisdom faculty uh, and uh, applying that, then we, uh, in a way, well, it's, it's rather like if you're going out for a walk through the woods, and <clears throat> rather than just making a thing, well I want to go in that direction, you know, I need to head south, so just go. <laughs> uh, and just barreling through the woods and dealing with all the you know, brambles and the undergrowth. and It's rather uh, it's, it's taking a moment to, to consider now, what looks like a good way forward? Are there any animal tracks here or any other pathways? You know, what, what's heading in the, roughly the right direction that looks like it's already uh, a, a well-made path that will you know, help me to get where I want to go, but with, without colliding with a lot of, uh, of obstacles. And so it's exactly the same spiritually, then we, if we develop and apply the, uh, the wisdom faculty, then it makes both the development of sila and samadhi a, a great deal easier. And there's also a significant teaching whether the Buddha says, um, you know, right view, samaditi, is the forerunner of all wholesome states. Just as the lightning of the sky and the and the, the beginning of the day uh, <clears throat> is the forerunner of the of the rising of the sun. Um, you know, the the sky gets brighter and clearer before the sun rises. You know, so too, the uh, the right right view is the forerunner and, and is the um, is the uh, that which precedes the arising of the the rest of the eightfold path. So that uh, 
right view is very is given a, a very specific prominence and primacy by by the Buddha in that respect. So please, uh, if you have any questions or comments, anything you would uh, like clarified, you're scratching your nose, Pierre, or is that a question? <laughs> Be careful when you, you might. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a question which I, I carried over from yesterday. Um, I've been trying to think about it, and uh, I wrote it down so that I, I would remember it because uh, it's, it's difficult for me to uh, remember things from one day to the next sometimes. And the question is, you were talking about ends and means at the beginning, and does the end ever justify the means? Uh, if the end is political, the answer is usually no. But is this always the case? Uh, for physicians and surgeons, the answer is less clear. Um, the doctor's dilemma is if um, carrying out or not carrying out this procedure, by, by doing this, am I extending life and enhancing the quality of life, or Am I just delaying death? Um, being mindful, we think on, uh, that's the northern expression, uh, what will be the result of this action? So we're looking at the mm -hmm. end. However, the result is an end, and the action, or withholding of the action, <coughs> is the means. Um, the precepts are very helpful, particularly in the light of the old path, uh, but um, not absolutes. Uh, I, for instance, I used to know a man who forged passports during World War II, and forging is pretty bad crime, in order to help Jews to escape. Who said it was that easy? <laughs> Now, in terms of the ends and the means, um, that's a, a, a very well-worn political dictum. That the end justifies the means, and used by various different political movements, the Communist Party. And <coughs> you can't have a, a you can't have an omelette unless you crack a few eggs, and such like. But in terms of, uh, of Buddhist practice, the ends, you can't separate the ends and the means. And this is a, a theme I bring up over and over again in terms of meditation. So that if you want the end to be peaceful, to be uh, integ well integrated, and to have a quality of uh, clarity to it, then you have to use the, a means that matches that end. So that if you are trying to establish concentration and you're suppressing all of your your uh, chattering thoughts, you're uh, enforcing your your body to sit in the lotus posture, um, and your your means are uh, self-willed and aggressive, then it's impossible to get a result that is is completely peaceful and and well integrated because the means. Uh, are directly connected to the end. So that uh, one of the aspects of meditation that I, uh, every retreat I've led for the last 25, 30 years, and almost invariably I talk about establishing loving kindness as a basic attitude uh, before trying to develop any kind of concentration or, or insight. You've got to learn how to work with your mind rather than fight against it to work with the body rather than, than force it. Um, so that uh, it's learning how to collaborate with the mind, speaking of using another <laughs> wartime term, to be a collaborationist, to collaborate with the mind uh, rather than be uh, uh, opposing it and uh, um, forcing it to behave through just... Um, uh, our own will or decide, you know, it's a decision because the a suppression um, 
And even though just by exercising our will and, and putting forth effort, you, you can get the mind to concentrate. You can force it to stay on an object. Uh, and you can just through, uh, through your own determination and effort, you can, you can make the mind concentrate. Uh, but it's a very um, fragile kind of concentration. So uh, the example I usually use is like it, when you have a police state that's very comprehensive surveillance and, and they are kind of keeping an eye on, on, they're watching everybody, they've got cameras everywhere and people, uh, <clears throat> uh, say, monitoring every, you know, every typewriter in the country when they used to have typewriters. <laughs> But uh, still, you know, as soon as the, the, the system wobbles, you know, then, then the revolution breaks out. And uh, there's all kinds of undercurrents of, uh, of, um, of uh, dissent going on in, in the background. And, and as soon as the system wobbles, as soon as there's a crack, then the, the thing is, uh, is overturned or is attacked. So that if we run our mind like a police state, just of forcing our good behavior and forcing our, our mind to, to concentrate or forcing you know, to the, the, the development of wisdom, you know, Anicca, 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 <laughs> then it, you, know, the, you can bring about a certain result. Like, you know, a fascist regime does have a certain orderliness in the, in the streets and in, in the train times and such like, but, if, you know, famously, but... Uh, the the tension that you're creating in the system is explosive, and then what happens when people who try to operate in that way? And I've seen this so many times. They come on a retreat or join the monastery, and they're kind of super keen, and the ones, you know, sitting absolutely so straight as a poker, and you know, totally committed, and they're always, um, you know, very very serious about their practice, and always starting before everybody else and finishing after everyone else, and they're doing everything absolutely perfectly then almost always you, you feel like, oh dear. <laughs> and I, I'm speaking of one of these, having been one of these people myself, you know, that uh, you, you know why the, the oh dear feeling is there, because it's being held in place by an act of, of will, usually based on idealism. Like, I want to be like that. That's the right thing to do. I'm going to be this way. <clears throat> and, uh, and not with a great deal of, uh, of wisdom. So that that principle of the end and the means being unified is absolutely f foundational. And because I, I caused myself immense misery by getting it wrong, <laughs> I, I tend to emphasize that. So that uh, when you are training the mind, then it's important to have that quality of loving kindness. And so that the phrase I, I use is radical acceptance. So loving kindness doesn't mean that you're trying to like everything, like if you have uh, aggressive or selfish thoughts or greedy or jealous thoughts. You're not saying, oh, whoopee, I'm feeling jealous. <laughs> you know, how marvelous, I'm, I want to murder the monk sitting next to me. <laughs> yeah. No, in, in, but you're recognizing, well, murderous thoughts arise. Jealous feelings arise, that, that they're part of nature. But you don't have to follow them. So there's an acceptance that, yes, this belongs, but no, that going in that direction will cause harm for myself and others and if I do actually murder the monk sitting next to me it, there'll be consequences on the legal level as well <laughs> certainly a few Sangha meetings so that um, that uh, the basis of of uh, how to act needs to be that quality of of a, of a total acceptance so you're not fighting against or, or hating. So even if you're printing passports to get Jewish people out of Nazi Germany, um, <clears throat> it's still important not to hate the Nazis, not to to cultivate that. And there, you know, some uh, I, these are obviously very challenging things to talk about, but it's it's possible. And there are some of the, the most marvelous and inspiring accounts of, of that period. Also nowadays, you know, people having been mistreated in, by other regimes and, and Different bodies that yeah, their their absolute refusal to hate the other and to demonize those who are harming them uh, is is incredibly moving. You're not condoning their actions or saying you know whoopee I'm so happy they're doing this, 
but you're also you're refusing to to demonize them and make them them other. Incidentally, uh, um, I, uh, the uh, the reference I was fishing for yesterday about William Blake was uh, something like it's better to murder an infant in its cradle than to than to nurse an unfulfilled desire. So that gets um, quoted quite a lot by people who are fond of following desires. <laughs> better to murder an infant in its cradle than to nurse an unfulfilled desire. So he, he was talking about, um, in a particular context, but uh, I think the, the key word there is nursing uh, an unfulfilled desire. So a desire can arise, but to, to, to know that... Um, as a desire, and to to consider the consequences, and then to to uh, to learn to let it go. It's not to suppress it or to to hate it, but just to to not follow it. So similarly, if we um, <clears throat> we feel that oh, I should never resist any of my desires, that's the right way. <laughs> uh, I should I should fully embrace. I should have acceptance for all my desires. Therefore, follow them. <laughs> yeah, William Blake said. Better to murder an infant in its cradle than to nurse a, an unfulfilled desire. Then that would be not using the wisdom faculty, but to consider: ah, well, <clears throat> I can know this desire without nursing it, without like taking hold of it and believing in it and and cherishing it. I can know I desire uh, you know, being uh, say attracted to to some person or wanting to have some particular thing to eat or to um, have something to enjoy um, that you can recognize well that's yeah that's a feeling <laughs> yeah I'd like to eat that but it's on somebody else's plate so you know, uh, I uh, I'll notice I can notice this feeling of desire and I I don't have to to cherish it I don't have to uh, figure out a way I can get that off that person's plate onto mine like you know <laughs> Are you can eat that. <laughs> uh, you can just notice and be fully aware of the desire, and then not follow it. So you're not nursing, you're not cherishing and taking hold of it. As long as you're carrying it around and uh, identifying with it, then it's going to cause problems. But if instead we simply know it as it is then just like the, the wind blowing in the trees, the wind blows, the branches move, the wind stops blowing, the branches stop moving. It's just a desire passing through, it's just the wind just the wind in the trees. As for um, your musings on doctors and <coughs> the results about are we delaying death or in, enriching life, those are all uh, subtle questions that people have to work out case by case, moment by moment. And it can be that you know, somebody, uh, a doctor does their, their job in a good way and helps someone's life to be extended and then that person uses their life in the most awful way. They, 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 they live in a most sort of wasteful and, and uh, indulgent or harmful way. <clears throat> and you think, well that was, <laughs> maybe I should have just let them die, you know, <laughs> would have saved a lot of trouble. That those are ethical issues that um, you know, doctors have to take on board when they take on the role of doctoring. But also, I would say that even if you save someone's life and they act in an awful way, even if they have one moment before they die of recognizing, well, I totally blew that. <laughs> that was a total waste of time. I had this great opportunity. That, uh, <clears throat> my life was, was extended uh, by this amount. And I just behaved in the most stupid, selfish, and and uh, reprehensible way, most awful way. What an idiot I am! That one moment of wisdom and clarity can <clears throat> can be enough to outweigh that considerable amounts of of unskillful behaviour. But uh, those are uh, 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 multi-layered moral issues that. Uh, you have to really look at and explore uh, moment by moment, case by case. There's no, you can't generalize, I would say. <laughs> yes, Nevin. I agree in a way that um, 
thing must be done, he'd be um, more knowledgeable on this, but because of the transference into English language, the word um, right then would be, and I, if I said it was wrong, that would be a wrong thing to say, but it would be an incorrect thing to say because the word sound point, of, as I believe, and um, you may never correct me on this, but it points to the middle wayness, which mm -hmm. is a, the subtlety of the Buddha's teaching that it's very, very extremely difficult to explain because if you have true truths you can't have a real it incorporates both of those aspects it incorporates many aspects so if I give a quick example you've got a glass there if it has nothing in it it's empty if you fill it up it's full which is the right view is it empty or full if you say it's neither empty nor full it's still there it incorporates many aspects mm -hmm. and the wisdom comes from the aspect not from the taking the point of view and saying this is correct. It's the knowledge that comes from that that is beneficial, not the attitude that I'm right. It's the right way, you know. Well that's pretty much what I said yesterday. Oh, so I wasn't here yesterday, so yeah. So <clears throat> the, the the image that I always like to use is that rather than the 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 middle way being uh, halfway between you know, right and wrong mm. uh, or indulgent and suppressive it's uh, the middle way is the point that the that uh, the the um, the polarities hinge from. So if you have the the uh, full over here, empty over here, the middle the, the the middle way is the point where both of those extremes emanate from. So it's like the 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 axis that they they uh, that the pendulum swing swings upon. So that's one way of of figuring it. One clever person said, but what is the middle way of the middle way is? As a criticism, I read that once. He said, the middle way, it was a criticism of the Buddha's middle way, that he never point the middle way of the middle way is. I know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to mean, but I'm, well, they, they may they be happy in their cleverness. If you say that's the middle way, then that's a fixed view. You fix the middle way. If that's your, if that's their opinion, then may they be happy with it. Yeah. Martin, yes. Any of the monastics? I know these readings are mainly for the monastic community. That <laughs> lay people are invited to come in. So maybe if the if the monastics have any particular questions or things they'd like to ask. Not that you should, guys should feel left out, but uh, it's mainly for the resident community that we have these readings, that even though it's, uh, ardent visitors are most welcome to, but uh, if any of those shy and restrained monastics like to ask anything? We only dress differently. Not only. There's other bits that uh, are involved as well. <coughs> yes. Uh, you said that um, that the, the Buddhist teaching wasn't written down, so it was available for everyone. There's a, there's a rule I've never quite understood. Isn't there some rule about not reciting the Dharma line by line with a lay person? I'm not quite sure how it goes. I don't really know what that meant. Um, yeah, it, there, there is a, a a rule that relates to that. Um, I, I'm not sure either, to be quite honest, because certainly you have lay people learning the the teachings and reciting them. They're, they're mentioned as reciting the teachings in in the canon, and um, there's no uh, no criticism of them for having learned to recite the the, the teachings. Um, and um, <clears throat> the uh, so somehow they're they're learning them, but exactly how they're supposed to learn them, uh, uh, I'm not or how they were learning them. I'm I'm not sure. It could be that there was some kind of um, formal way that uh, the acharya and the student was or sit down together, and it was more of a kind of that's the monastic style of doing things. And that that that, uh, that sort of one to one sitting down and, and learning the teaching face to face that way was this is just my interpretation of it because I've tried to understand that from before was maybe that was 
um, uh, sort of seen as only only the monastics should be, should be doing that together, and there was some other way that the lay people were able to to learn or to uh, to memorize the teachings. I I can't uh, I can't be sure, but it's 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 a curious thing. You're not the first person to have remarked on it, because you have uh, lay people you know, learning the teachings, reciting the teachings. There's um, people. Uh, I think the um, <coughs> Nanda's mother. Nanda Mata, I think she's reciting the um, the Atakavaga, the, the the chapter of the eights in the uh, from Sutta Nipata, and it's sort of it's uh, commented on how well she recites that and uh, and how well she's learned that, and so um, and other occasions as well. So it's one of those mysteries of the Pali tradition. If you find out, let me know. So. <laughs> 